In this episode of Ask Paul Kirtley, we are going to talk about forest access for fire and for wheelchairs. We're going to talk about what to do when clothing gets wet. Quite a big open-ended question that I'll do my best. And tarp lines at head height. Welcome, welcome to episode 84 of Ask Paul Kirtley. And good to be back. I'm Paul Kirtley. This is where I answer questions posed to me by followers of my YouTube, my podcast, my online materials, and my site, particularly at paulkirtley.co.uk. And I give an answer and possibly point you in the direction of useful resources if I know where they can be found as well. All right, so these are all questions that have been sent in. This is from Jörg, and Jörg asks on Twitter, hashtag AskPaulKirtley, that's how I find these questions. Um, Hi Paul, I appreciate asking questions to a pro. Well, I do my best, yeah. Um, Two topics. What are the legal regulations for operating a campfire in the UK? And two, is there a legal restriction for wheelchair users in the UK to enter the forest, like in Germany? Thank you very much, Jörg. Um, Well, I'll answer your second question, a little light aircraft coming over. It's always the same. You sit down, peaceful day, Bit of, uh, bit of uh, bird life around, twittering away, but otherwise it's not too noisy. And then you get a little single engine plane going across the top. <laughs> Just. Um, I'll answer the second one first, Jörg. To my knowledge, there is no legal restriction for wheelchair users in the UK entering uh, forests. Um, correct me if I'm wrong below. Um, my reading of this question is that, is there a restriction stopping wheelchair users from entering the forest? Um, the, the thing that causes people difficulty, of course, is the nature of the terrain. So some places are easier to access than others, of course, here. But I, I don't know of any restrictions stopping people accessing should they wish to, which is the way that I'm reading that question, Jörg. Question number one, which was, what are the legal regulations for operating a campfire in the UK? Well, Basically, the simplest way is to say landowner's permission, landowner's permission. So you need permission from the person who um, owns or possibly controls the land, someone who has the authority to say, yes, that is okay. And that comes from the landowner. It may be devolved or uh, delegated to somebody else who has responsibility for managing access or managing the manage- the actual management of the place but gen- but fundamentally it's down to to landowner permission simple i think okay question from andrew also via twitter Hashtag ask Paul Kirtley. I'm getting a bit um, silhouetted. The sun's come out now. It was quite dingy before, but the, now that I've set up, the sun's come out kind of behind me. But you don't need to see my face. You just need, you need to hear my voice if you're watching the video. What do you do when or if things go horribly awry and all your gear and clothes get wet? How do you dry various pieces of kit and what do you prioritize? And that's from Andrew in St. Louis in the US. Okay. So context is an important point here, Andrew. Um, Both in terms of what is your situation, um, as well as um, in terms of where are you? How long are you going to be out? um, What infrastructure is around you? Um, what's the temperature, how long have you been cold and wet? Okay, so there's a few things that kind of come into 
come into this. Um, particularly when it comes to prioritizing. So, a couple of episodes back, I, I meandered through attempting to answer a question about how my bushcraft philosophy had possibly changed over the years. And one of the things I talked about there was understanding when you're not asking the right question. And I, this is something I you know, ask of myself as well. Am I asking the right question? It's all well and good posing a question and seeking an answer to it, but the, the question is, it pivots on some of our prejudices and maybe misprioritizations or maybe overly focusing on this rather than focusing on this. Uh, there may be confirmation bias and there's all sorts of things that can be going on as to why we are asking a question in the first place, right? So one of the things we should check ourselves with is are we asking the right questions all right now if I'm looking at a trip or a situation that I might find myself in outdoors where in the planning of that trip or that expedition or that whatever it is yeah because we're talking I'm trying to answer a general question in general terms right it's easier if I answer specific things with specific advice, but I'll try and give you some general thinking on this because general thinking is also useful if, if it's couched in the right way. Um, and this is a general point. Like if I'm planning a trip and it's critical that certain pieces of equipment don't get wet, or let's put it, let's even just reverse. If I'm planning a trip and certain pieces of equipment getting wet is a disaster, then we need to have a think about that. So an example would be a, a spring or autumn fall trip um, by canoe where the water temperature in the spring is going to be cool. The air temperature at night might be quite cool on either of those trips. So you're going to need your sleeping bag. And the chances of you submerging your kit, you're in a canoe, right? It's chances of you submerging your kit are significantly non-zero. Getting a sleeping bag dry, particularly not in the middle of the summer when the ambient temperature is quite high, even at the ends and beginning of the day, is pretty tricky. And some people will tell you, oh, well, you know, you can sleep in a synthetic bag when it's wet you can but it's unpleasant and it's still not as warm as it is when it's not uh, wet um okay a, a down bag will clump more and probably have even less insulation but either way you don't want them to be wet and getting them dry is problematic particularly if you've committed to covering distance right um maybe you can get your sleeping bag dry during a day that's sunny if you don't go anywhere and you just have your, you know, you just make, make your sleeping bag oriented towards the sun, you let it sit in the sun, you, as the sun moves, you move it a bit, you hang it where it's going to be in the sun, you move it around, but you're losing a day of journeying, right? So that's an example where you really don't want your sleeping bag to get wet, yeah? You're probably not going to die if it gets wet, but it's just going to cause you a pretty miserable time. And, um, you know, it may take days to get it dry and you're going to have some rough nights of sleep. And I've known of one situation, one trip where a, um, a participant uh, that was with us, the, the boat was in some fairly shallow rapids. They kind of got stuck and capsized a bit. It was hardly deep enough to sink the boat, but it was in the flow and the flow into the portage bag allowed water to get into the dry bag because the bag, it was it was single bagged um, and then they had to work to get that it was a synthetic bag thankfully which wasn't you know it was not as bad as it would have been if it was a, a down bag in terms of getting the thing sorted because of the way that the down clumps um, but there was a lot of managing a sleeping bag around a fire all of that night until the early hours, like about eight hours of drying um, from about four or five in the afternoon until, I don't know, one, two o'clock in the morning. 
And um, the key thing there is to make sure the bag doesn't get wet in that situation. So the last Miss and Ivy trip that um, we did, <laughs> and Ray Goodwin won't mind me mentioning this because we joked about it on a course we ran together not too long ago. There's a rapid called, oh, what's it called? Like Sharp Rock, Sharp Rock Rapid, Sharp Rock Falls. You come to a corner and then it sort of drops off and we were doing it in September. There wasn't a lot of water in it. And the previous time we'd done that trip, we ended up lining the boats down the right-hand side, but there was even less water in it this time. And so there was a chute of water, like a channel of water going down the left-hand side. And we thought, well, we can partly line. And also because we're a group of eight participants, plus myself and Ray Goodwin, we can sort of manhandle the boats uh, down a bit and, and whatnot but Ray wanted to film some of this and so once the first couple had gone down and there was one bit where the boat slid down and it passed from one person to another where it could kind of get the the bow of the boat caught on um, this kind of cauldron of rock that it was going into and then there was flow going out of it and as long as the front went into the flow the boat would go down the next bit and it's fine so anyway the first couple went down my boat comes the boat that I am, someone else was paddling, uh, and that gets passed down. But Ray took more of a back seat on this one of controlling what was going on from his position at the top and was filming it and it came down a bit too fast and sh overshot where it needed to be, got stuck. The back end came into the flow there and it dropped down and there was water pushing into it and it was stuck on the rock here because it's all jaggedy rock. And it took us quite some time to get this thing out and righted and, and down. And my portage pack was in the flow the whole time. And so I, of course, then wanted to check everything was okay and it wasn't full of water, but none of my gear got, none of my gear got wet. And that isn't me, me going, oh, you know, I'm amazing someone else wasn't so amazing on another trip. No, no, that's not the point. The point is that um, I've got more experience. Um, I also need to um, practice what I preach and what I preach with sleeping bags is double bag them. Two proper submersible dry bags around your sleeping bag. Um, you can have it in even more than that if you want. That doesn't necessarily include the outer uh, bag, you know, like a seal line or MEC or, or similar bag that's, you know, Ortlieb that is the, the bag with straps on that's like a portage pack. Some of those are almost like dry bags. I don't class that as a dry bag because they can get holes in them, right? Um, so the, the sleeping bag, the bag that the sleeping bag is in is two submersible dry bags and um, doesn't get wet then. So if I'm looking at a trip thinking, what do I do if, you know, it's going to be really problematic if something gets wet. I work back to how do I make sure it doesn't get wet? Or what can I do to maximize the chances of it not getting wet? Um, that's the first step. If you identify that as a problem, then you work back to try and mitigate it as a problem in your planning, in your kit selection, etc., so that it then isn't a problem. Um, or it's very, very, very unlikely to be a problem. And do it in a way that isn't so handicapping on the trip as a whole that it becomes impractical, right? Um, so as a general point, that, that's also what I would say. Um, similarly, have a ditch kit. If you're paddling in cold weather and you don't have a dry suit on, then you're gonna to want to have a change of clothes that is, again, probably double bagged, that is easy to get into, even when your body is wet. Um, wool, merino top, for example, buffalo top, something that you can get into quickly and get warm, spare warm beanie, maybe even some warm gloves to put on. Um, ditch kit's really important, right? So. Those are the times when I'm most likely to get wet is when I'm, when I'm paddling. And then like, how critical is it that things don't get wet? I, I always wanna have dry clothes, particularly when the water's cold and particularly when the air temperature's cold, even if I'm not wearing a dry suit. If I'm wearing a dry suit, um, less critical because 
I'm not going to get the cold water on my on my body but on an expedition um, I'm in the fall and the spring I'm normally not wearing a dry suit but I'll still have some a few warm clothes it's, the water's not as cold in the fall of course um, but again so again context is important so what do you want to be dry if you capsize and you go in yourself and your kit goes in what when you drag everything onto the bank what do you want the situation to be you want your sleeping kit to be dry and you want to have a dry change of clothes particularly if you've been in cold water and or the, the, the air temperatures are cold um, that's that's important um, then more generally really good waterproof jacket particularly jacket and um, particularly something that's going to protect your core um, whether I'm working here in the woods, just running courses, I you need to be out all day. I don't get to choose the weather. The weather does what it's going to do. That's the week the course is running. I've got to run the course and not succumb to being cold and wet and, you know, all of the things that go with that. Reduce blood sugar more rapidly, um, irritableness, you know, potential, you know, bad decisions, all of those things, right? So as a leader, I'm going to make sure that I stay as dry as possible. So I had another question from someone which I haven't included in Ask Paul Curley because it was a while ago and it was quite time specific to what they were doing, but they were asking about keeping dry. Um, if you're going out backpacking, you will get wet at some point, particularly in the UK, particularly in Scotland, it is going to rain on you, right? I've never done, a, I don't think I've ever done a backpacking trip in Scotland that's more than a couple of days where I have not got rained on, particularly in the hills. Yeah, you get these localized rain showers, you know, that you, particularly in the mornings or as the temperature goes down in the evenings and the clouds come over the hills, you get rain, you get wet. Um, and so you, you need to, you, you know, that should not be a surprise to you, right? And so you need to plan accordingly. You need decent waterproofs. Um, suitable for what you're doing like if you're hiking with a backpack you want something that's quite breathable that's got good ventilation whereas if you're standing around maybe you want something that's a bit more protective but the ventilation doesn't matter so much so um you know so for example for for hiking and backpacking i've got quite a nice marmot um it's quite a few years old now gore-tex pro shell it's got pit zips it's got a really solid zip on the front um but it's it's kind of more of an alpine cut it's quite light but it's still breathable very good hood on it um, great for in the hills great for up above the tree line protective um, not the toughest thing in, I mean it's still reasonably robust not the toughest thing in the world though when I'm working in the woods um, I've got a Swazi tar um, which is like a smock that comes down just above uh, my knees really big big hood heavier more robust for the woods also good for hunting because it's got that quiet um, outer on it as well almost like mole skin um, and a really nice drab color as well for blending into uh, into the the woods and and the tussock grass and all those sorts of things so that's something that i like for those sorts of circumstances and again it's going back to how do i how do i keep my core dry um whether that's just from environmental moisture but also um perspiration as well i'm thinking about that so specifying the equipment and how you pack it goes a long way to making sure that you stay dry now i had this other question a while ago someone asking me oh i want to do a lot i want to do some long distance trails um what do i do if i get wet and i want to stop for about an hour so how do i stay warm if i'm wet and i stop for an hour well again you're not asking the right question yeah the 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 answer the the the, the, the question is wrong it's, it's it's in the sense that you're being inflexible like if 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 it's chucking it down with rain and everything on the outside is wet and you want to stop for a meal like have a quick lunch or something you don't need to stop for an hour get some fuel in yourself keep going get to the end of your day get your tent up get your tarp up whatever you've got with you your shelter get sorted get dry as much as possible um, so when I'm lightweight backpacking, I don't tend to take a lot of spare clothes with me. I just make sure the clothes I've got with me perform well. And um, that's good waterproofs, good wicking base layers, 
um, things that don't hold a lot of moisture. They might smell a bit after a while, like the, 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 the um, synthetic base layers and things, um, but they don't hold a lot of moisture. And that's important because then you're not going to get too cold. Um, even if you've been sweating and it's been raining and then when I get into the t you know when I get into the tent the shell stuff can go in the vestibule I can get into the tent and I'll stay in there until I have to get out again um, and that's normally uh, in the morning when I want to make breakfast and then I just stay in the clothes right um, in the tent I can have a spare what I think is nice to have is just like a spare thin merino top and some sleeping bag socks if you've got that maybe a spare pair of undies particularly if the water you know you have one of those wet underpant days on the hill in scotland where it's like all around the top of your waistband somehow has got wet um having a spare pair of merino undies thin thin merino top and just some uh nice fluffy socks that aren't too heavy you know like terry uh, ulfrotto makes some wool power now and make some nice uh, sort of loop stitch socks that aren't very heavy but really cozy and they're not great for hiking and they don't wear very well but they're light and they're fantastic in a sleeping bag so even if you're a bit chillier than you want to be you get your wet stuff off chuck it in the vestibule put your dry stuff on in the tent get in your sleeping bag with a, having had a meal you know even if you had to cook that outside in the rain get in there you'll have a good night's sleep put the wet you'll be nice and warm and toasty there's no wet coming to the tent with you or the bivy bag or whatever you're doing. There's no wet in there. Everything's outside of that. Uh, it's the same with canoeing. It's like if I've got dry pants on, um, which I often do, um, unless it's really warm and um, a waterproof jacket and stuff, I'll wear that around camp. I'll get camp set up, you know, communal tarp, etc. It can be quite soggy. Um, that can just go in the tent vestibule. Um, you know, I tend to have a lightweight tarp and a lightweight tent for canoe trips because then I can get, you know, I can get out of the tent, I can get changed and things, I can get buoyancy aids on, etc. Still with the tarp up quite high, and we'll feed into that question that, that's coming next as well. Um, and the tent's my little bubble, um, keeps keeps the bugs out, um, has everything's dry in there, keeps my sleeping bag dry. It's just like a combination of everything that I need on a on a canoe trip in somewhere like Canada or. Um, Scotland or wherever you know you've got the you've got the weather protection but you've also got the bug protection and then you've got a silicon nylon tarp so again when I was a kid you know teenager and I was doing starting to do backpacking trips everything was heavy you had to make a choice between a tent or a tarp now you can take both you know Hilleberg Acto and a silicon nylon tarp weighs less than my tent did when I was younger um, you know it weighs less than like I had a double hooped bivy bag that um, I used to use for backpacking that was as heavy as my Hilleberg Acto tent is. So there's some, some fantastic gear now. So it's easier to stay dry and it's easier to organize yourself. Um, now, if you're worried about things being submerged rather than it just being precipitation, um, you want submersible bags. So a lot of the dry bags that are sold for rucksack liners will work for keeping the rain out as long as you roll over the tops and, and finish them, uh, close them. Um, but as soon as you throw that into a river, whether that's you're doing a river crossing with your backpack on or whether you're canoeing and, and you capsize, as soon as you throw that into a river, the water will get in there. You want something that's submersible. So um, the type of uh, slightly thicker material that's tough, um, Ortlieb, uh, Seal Line, um, NRS, um, quite a few others make that type of material, but I think Ortlieb and Seal Line are the ones that I like the best. Ortlieb's more available over in, in the UK and Europe, Seal Line's more available in North America. NRS also makes some similar ones, um, and again, they're easy to get hold of in North America, although you can get them in the UK. Um, submersible bags, so definitely for canoeing, for your day bag kit, your ditch kit, or whatever, for your um, sleeping gear for your spare clothing it should all be in submersible dry bags double bag your sleeping bag as, as I say then um, for backpacking if you're doing river crossings as part of your backpacking trip and there is a chance that you go in um, use an Ortlieb bag as a rucksack liner 
you can still use ultra light little bags you know like the gossamer gear stuff and the um the granite gear and any number of other manufacturers that there are now whether that really thin even um even um xbed makes some really ultra light bags now and then you can organize your gear even color code it and have it packed inside but as an overall rucksack liner ortlieb rolled over enough attached and then you can put that in the river and water won't go in and then even if you get a little dribble of water in as you unroll because sometimes water gets into the rolls as you unroll you get water and if you've got those little ultralight bags that are a bit water resistant then you're not going to get your spare socks or your beanie or anything inside that are separately organized they're not going to get damp so again organizing the kit it, it starts to remove the relevance of the question of what happens if stuff gets wet. You're removing the chances of it getting wet, and that's an important way to think about it. Um, the, other, the other situations, of course, are if you're doing like a snow walking trip and you um, go through the ice. Again, you want suitable changes of clothing. Maybe you need a change of boot liner. Maybe you need a change of socks. Um, maybe you need uh, a change of top layer. Um, depending on how far you go in of course and um, having those things um, easily accessible on your toboggan um, and available for change those are those are important things so again it's context specifying what might need to be what might need to be done fire is a big help again general point to a general question in terms of getting stuff dry fire is super super helpful um, but of course fire comes with a with a danger um, particularly around synthetic materials like the, the really ultra fine woven synthetic materials that you have on sleeping bags any little spark burns holes in that stuff so you need to be very careful draping it over tripods over fires and things. you have to kind of actively manage that it's like hold it make sure that it's not getting sparks on it be mindful of other people managing the fire for cooking and for them to be mindful of you as well um, you know if they're raking coals around for cooking that might throw sparks up you know you both need to be communicating but fire makes a huge difference yeah I've done some um, pretty damp trips where nobody's been like horrendously wet in the sense of no not it's not like they've fallen in and everything's wet but you get soggy right if it's just raining for 11 hours and you're hiking you know or it's you know raining for 11 hours um and you're sat in a canoe or portaging even your waterproof stuff is going to be soggy it stops beading after a while it gets damp on the outside it gets it, it you know it um, evaporates more you lose more heat even if it's not letting water in you do start to get water in you know if it's blowing in your face you might get you, know, you start to get damp around here around the shoulders as I say you can get it in the tops you know where clothing joins zips sometimes fail all those sorts of things fire makes a huge difference if you can just stand around a fire and let the you know the ambient heat you know evaporated off your kit evaporate off your clothing you're back to square one again the next day rather than starting with everything soggy that makes a huge huge difference so um that's that's how i would prioritize yeah prioritize your sleeping kit um pretty much in any situation um footwear in cold conditions is important um having you know if you think you're going to be fully immersed in cold water you need a change of clothing that is dry regardless of how you got wet in the first place and then you can sort that out later because the immediate issue is far more uh, perilous than getting stuff dry afterwards you ain't going to be standing around naked getting your stuff dry in really cold conditions you're going to you're going to struggle you're going to perish um or and else you don't need to make your your life that difficult either um so again think ahead and then work back to how can we mitigate that with making sure that situation is less likely to happen like is it unlikely that you're going to fall in on a canoe trip no yeah um is it unlikely that you're ever going to step through ice when you're doing a snow walking trip on rivers particularly where there's moving water underneath no it's not um is it an issue if even if you're out on a day trip in by in canoe 
in November in the UK and the water's very cold and the overnight temperature was you know, near to freezing and you fall in and you're not wearing a dry suit, is that gonna be an issue for you? Yes, so make damn sure that you've got dry clothing in a dry bag that you can put on. Uh, if you're out on a sunny day in April in the lakes or in Scotland or somewhere else in the UK or you know, maybe slightly later in the year, another part in North America where you've got that continental cold, but the water's cold in the spring, right? But it can be warm sunshine. You fall out of your canoe on those days, you're, you're out of nice ambient sort of 18, 19, 20 degrees centigrade, or at least it feels like that with the sun on your skin. You go into really cold water that's as cold as it was um, at any time of the year, uh, other than being frozen, um, you're gonna be in a world of trouble. I mean, there is safety issues beyond the, um, the, the question here in terms of can you get back in the boat? Have you had proper training? You should be wearing a buoyancy aid, all of those things. But just in terms of the question about getting kit wet, you wanna be able to get to the side one way or the other. You need to be able to self-rescue one way or the other. So not be far enough off the side that you can't swim to shore. Or if you're that far out, you've got to be able to know that you can self-rescue, get back in the boat, empty it or paddle it to the side. If you can't, you shouldn't be there. Um, you should have a buoyancy aid on because that will increase your survival time. And then when you get to the side and you've been in cold water, you want to have a change of clothes and that needs to be in a dry bag attached to the boat so that you haven't lost it. So that's all the sort of stuff that goes through my mind. Um, less than okay, how do I get this dry? But I know fire is, the, fire is the easiest way of getting things dry by a long shot. So again, fire skills. And if you are um, in extremis, you may have to change the plan for your trip. You may have to stop and sort things out and then that changes your trip. But then you need to have you know, options with where do you end up? Yeah? Because if you have to get to the end by a particular point, it can be problematic. You don't want to be forced into the situation where you have to move on when you're really struggling with wet clothing, wet sleeping gear and what have you. So again, have some flexibility in your, in your planning, perhaps in terms of having some contingency in, in the trip planning. And we always put contingency in trip planning. Um, things can be, things can take longer. Um, weather can be a problem, wind, rain etc again um how do we stop getting wet in the worst conditions don't be out in it how do you not be out in the worst conditions have enough time in your trip that you can sit it out for a day in a tent um under a tarp by the fire or what have you but if you don't have the time then you're out in it and then you're getting more wet or more likely to be getting wet and then you've got to deal with it so you're compounding your problems so a lot of it comes down to planning in my mind um but then the, the, the general answer is fire, prioritize um, layers that are being close to your skin and your sleeping equipment if it has become wet, which it shouldn't have been if you packed it properly. That's a long answer, but as I say, it was, it was gonna be a difficult one to answer in, in general. But hopefully that gives you some food for thought. Please come back with more questions, um, Andrew come back with follow-up questions if you wish and anybody listening to this if it sparks questions send me a, a question ask paul kirtley hashtag ask paul kirtley on twitter or instagram or um, email to me if you're on my email mailing list which you should be if you're watching this um, go to paulkirtley.co.uk sign up for my email mailing list my general email mailing list you get informed of every new podcast every new article every new video that goes up on my site and there's quite a lot of those um, as well as me sharing some old but still very relevant material so for example one of the things we haven't even got into here is hypothermia i've got quite a good piece on hypothermia on my site i've got some other pieces on fire lighting etc all of which would be useful around this topic of discussion right fire lighting in damp cold conditions that becomes more important still if you are thinking about what if I'm damp and cold as well? What if my clothing's damp? What if it's wet? What if my sleeping bag's wet and needs drying? You really want your fire lighting to work then, don't you, in those situations? So all that stuff on my site, go to paulcurtley.co.uk, sign up for the general email updates, but also you can then reply to any of those emails and that email will come to me. So you can use that email address to, to, to uh, send me a question as well if you want, or on my site, you can go to the Ask Paul Kirtley section there's about halfway down there, something called speak pipe. You just press record, you record your question using your phone or using your um, laptop or whatever, and 
that then comes to me and I will include it in one of the shows, hopefully. Okay, last question, tarp lines at head height. And this is a, an audio question. Hi Paul, um, Craig Shaw here. I just want to say thank you so much for uh, bringing me into the bushcraft world in, in, in the cerebral way that you uh, have done so. Um, disappointed um, that you haven't done more ask uh, Paul Kirtley's uh, more more recently. I'm, I'm, I'm nearly up to date with all of them. Um, I'd love to see you continue to um, provide uh, the great advice that you've been doing. I'll cut to the chase. Um, when I put up tarps, um, it seems that in order to get the height of the, the main line through the middle of the tarp, uh, I need my tallest friend to help me get the, the height right. But then all the knots that you have um, sh generally shown require the, the ropes to be at sort of waist height. I just wondered if you could address um, how you deal with this. Uh, so I haven't seen uh, you tie knots at sort of head height or above. Uh, I just wondered if you could clarify how you do this. Thank you very much. Keep up the good work. That's a good question. And I share a little anecdote. Um, Ray Goodwin, who works with me on a lot of our canoeing courses and trips, um, he was demonstrating how to set up a, using a throw bag rope or a tow rope, set up a bridle so that you basically attach a rope to the seats inside the ropes underneath the boat there's an attachment point there and then the rope comes away and so if you're pulling the boat upstream it helps bring the boat up so it's kind of on top of the water because the pull point is underneath the boat particularly if you're pulling from above rather than the boat plowing into the water that you're pulling it against and of course that can swamp or snag the boat and he was showing how to set this up on on one side where he attached the rope to the seat he attached it with a clove hitch and on the other side he attached it with a round turn and two half hitches and he then asks the students around why he had tied it that way and if there was an advantage of one over the other and the students started to come up with reasons why this one was quicker to release or you could adjust it at this that and the other and the strains da 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 um it the, the answer was it didn't matter which one you used, you could use two round turn half hitches, you could use two clove hitches, it didn't matter. Um, and then another another aside, which wasn't part of Ray's point, but round turn and two half hitches is very closely related to the clove hitch anyway, and you can go away and investigate that. Students on my online elementary already know that because that's, that's covered off um, in there. But the point is that that knot there did not matter in particular. And Conversely, there are some specific areas where sometimes we want to tie a particular knot and that works very well for that job for a particular reason. And I think the knots that you're referring to in asking that question that I've shown freely on my YouTube channel are these basic knots that you need for putting up a personal tarp. Um, for putting up a tarp between two trees or what have you using one of the Siberian hitches at one end um, using a taut tarp hitch at the other end which is related to uh, half hitches basically it's a couple of half hitches tied in a slightly different way to just two back-to-back -back half hitches and then you're also doing the adjustable guy line hitch right so those are the ones that I've shown on my YouTube channel and they've been on there for years and yes you set that tarp up if you're lying on the ground and sleeping on the ground you want to be able to sit up underneath and a good rule of thumb to sit up underneath is to set the ridge line at about the bottom of your sternum yep so about mid chest yeah because then when you're sat underneath most people's proportions would mean that you can sit up with your head underneath the apex that's why they're set at that height now are they the only ways that I set tarps up? No. Um, are they the only knots that you could use to set a tarp at that height? No. Um, 
do I set tarps up higher? Yes, particularly group tarps. Now, you might be asking from the perspective of a group tarp, but you might also be asking from the perspective of a hammock, because if you want a hammock set up, clearly you probably want the hammock where I might put a tarp if I was sleeping on the ground, and then you want the tarp above that so you've got room for your hammock underneath. That might be why you're asking. And so, yes, you can use the same knots if you can reach, but starting to do that event hitch, um, or the Siberian hitch, whatever you want to call it, um, slippery figure of eight with a quick release is actually what it is. Um, you can do that up there, but it's a bit trickier. And the same with the, the taut tarp hitch. You can do that up there, but it's a bit trickier. So you can do that, or you could get a tree stump and stand on it. Um, what I often use when I'm working higher up, though, is a timber hitch. Uh, and particularly if I'm putting a group tarp up, which is still spanning between two trees, I'll probably use a timber hitch because you can tie it lower down and push it up with a stick. And it's also relatively easy to undo. And then you can do any manner of things. So one of the tricks you can, you can if you really want to set a, a tarp, so it's really just at fingertips, rather than trying to tie it all off up here with the blood draining from your fingers, not really being able to see or feel what you're doing, um, what you can do is just take it around the tree back on itself, like the, the, the taut tar pitch type arrangement, um, preferably go underneath and then back on itself over the top, but then bring it down to say like the bottom of this tree has some exposed roots, tie it off down there if you've got enough cordage. Yeah. So you've got your span, and then you can tie it off lower down. When you're talking about bigger tarps, and I think we showed this briefly in the video that I made with Mike from TA Outdoors, and I'll link to that. Um, I'll try and even link to it. If, if my technology skills allow, I'll try and link to it the point where we do this. We're setting up, I remember we set up a group tarp, and I remember this because we were asked a question about what we use. I did use a timber hitch. Well, I, I'd likely use a timber hitch. I think I did, because that's normally what I use for that higher up, thicker rope attachment. Um, and then I've got a number of ways of attaching it at the other end, either tying it off directly on the tree or bringing it down. But there is a little trick that I use using a carabiner to create a three to one pulley system to, to tighten it. And it's, it's like a wagoner's hitch basically um, to, to tension it using a carabiner as well. Um, that's something I teach regularly on, on campcraft sections of our canoeing courses. I teach it on the campcraft sections of the woodcraft, of course, but it's not something I've put on YouTube, um, largely because I just, you know, there's lots of stuff I haven't put on YouTube. So um, linking that back around to my anecdote about Ray is one of the reasons he showed and messed with the students a little bit there by saying, here's, here's a knot, here's a knot, which is which one is best or why did I do it this way? Why did I tie that one that, that one in there? Is because one of the problems we all have as instructors, whether we're putting things online for people to watch as a lesson on YouTube or on a paid course or what have you, or whether we're teaching it in person, if we teach something one way on a particular day, people, and this is not meant as a criticism, but people will take that, particularly if they don't have any other context around it, and they will take that kind of like the gospel according to Ray Goodwin or the gospel according to Paul Kirtley, like this is how you must tie a tarp between two trees. And then they try and use it in a slightly different context without other knot knowledge or without the confidence to go, actually, this, is, this doesn't work so well here. It works here, but it doesn't work well there. Maybe I can use some other things. And then that either creates a, a clash for themselves just in terms of making things work, or they become dogmatic themselves in sharing what they know with other people. Like, this is the way I learned it. This is the way you must do it as well. I saw Paul Kirtley do it once, or I saw Ray Goodwin do it once, or I saw Ray Mears do it once, or whoever, right? And so the point that Ray was making was, sometimes I do it this way, and sometimes I do it this way, but people who see me do it this way tend to be dogmatic about doing it that way, and people who see me do it that way tend to be dogmatic. And there are more ways of skinning a cat than just one of those, right? And so it's the same with setting lines up between trees. There's lots of different ways of doing it. Um, I would say generally in your repertoire, what's good to have is a, be able to tie a timber hitch, be able to tie a round turn and two half hitches, be able to have a look at things like a mariner's hitch, have a look at the tarp taut hitch, which I think you've already looked at, um, 
have a look at ways of just wrapping something around a tree, doubling it back on itself without tying it off and then bringing it down. So a little bit like you start with the, 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 the tar, tar pitch, you go around the back of the tree. I tend to go over and then back under to tension it. If you do the opposite, if you come around under and over, you can then pull that into the tree, but then pull it down to a root to tie it off. Yeah, that would be a useful way of, it's simple, without having any sort of extra mechanical pulleying, it's gonna tighten that span on a thin cord for putting a personal tarp up higher, and you can still tie it off lower down if you want to into the tree. Tree one, span there, bring it down, tie it off, or even down to a root system. As long as it doesn't pull it in such a way as it slides down the tree, which it shouldn't do, as long as you do that first bit tight enough, and the tree isn't ridiculously smooth. So I hope that helps. Um, I'll try and link to some relevant resources for you. And um, yeah, let me know if that helped. If you, if you do see this or listen to this, let me know if that helped and opened up a few doors for you. Uh, I'm glad I'm producing some more Aspel Curtis for you. And uh, I look forward to answering more questions in the future. Just to say, like, subscribe, uh, share on your favorite platforms if this is not on your favorite podcast platform if you're an interest if you're a, a, an audio um listener and you're interested in it being on a platform it isn't just let me know again you can get hold of me on twitter at p kurt p k i r t um and let me know or you can email me that's the best way probably of, of communicating that with me and i think that's it for now um I plugged the book last time, so I won't plug it now. Um, online courses at onlinebushcraftcourses.com, particularly the online elementary. Um, I don't know how I make more people, and there's quite a lot of people in there, but make more people aware of how much quality information is in there. If you, if you understand the kind of ecosystem of free information I've created, um, Imagine what I could do if I was charging for it. That's kind of where, where the paid stuff is. Um, so have a look at that online uh, bushcraftcourses.com. The online elementary course in particular is so broadly applicable. I've got students from um, Alaska and Northwestern Canada all the way across down into California. I've got students all over the UK, Western Europe, Central Europe, some in Eastern Europe. I've got students on that in Japan, students on that in Australia, quite a lot in Australia actually. Um, and yeah, it's a great, great foundation um, of bushcraft uh, knowledge and skill there waiting for you. So if you're interested in that, I think it's really very good value for what it is. Um, and if you'd like a little bit of a taster, um, there's you can get some uh, sample videos on that site but also if you sign up for my fire fundamentals free course there's a lot going on here I'll, I'll put the link on the video um, but uh, pk blog pk blog dot it pk blog it forward slash fire fundamentals with capital f's fire fundamentals that will take you to the sign up page where you can get the, those 10 free lessons and in amongst those is some content from the online elementary, which isn't the free samples you can get otherwise, um, but it's specifically around fire. Um, so there's like a little freebie in there for you to see. And that again, gives you some idea of what's in that course. So you get all of that great free fire stuff. There's a little freebie from the paid courses in there as well. And it gives you a good idea of um, all of the practical stuff around this, because of course, Again, people go, oh, why are you sat there just talking? This is just a talking show. It's like, yeah, this show is just a talking show. There's a lot of other stuff that isn't. And I like to have that balance, right? So anyway, I talked enough. Thanks for watching. Hope you enjoyed this one. Thanks for the questions. Look forward to more questions in the future. See you soon on another episode, or at least you'll hear me soon on another episode of Ask Paul Kirtley. Take care. Cheers.